Okay, folks, hold on, guys. Remember, we're on StreamYard. Being on StreamYard, there's going to be about a 16-second delay. Just one second, guys. I got to now go on Facebook and make sure it's not private. So, guys, hit the like button. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe. Invite people to come and learn. This is going to be a spiritual meat fest, and it's also going to be a look at the history of the church. Very vitally important subject. Glory to the Father, glory to the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, glory to the Holy Spirit. So, guys, get ready. Get your Bipsy bub going. Get your pizza. Invite folks. Hit the like button. Make this go viral for the glory of Jesus Christ, not for our praise. But I do want to say something. I have some sad news. You guys ready? Alan Rule, what's up, brother? Are you ready for the sad news? Now, remember, there's going to be a 16-second delay between when I say something and it reaches you. Bibsy, Bob Gordon. All right. You guys want to hear some sad news? Sad news, guys. You see I'm by myself, right? I'm all by myself. You know what that means, guys? Let me give you some sad news and break it slowly to you. The sad news is that Seraphim Hamilton, he's here waiting. <laughs> Just kidding. Pull your leg, man. I pull your leg like this. You got scared, right? He's waiting in the background. But no, all kidding aside, I need your prayers. Glory to Jesus Christ. Yesterday, yesterday was an amazingly intense session. Hilariously funny. We went through the Hadiths. And we showed how stupid, irrational Muhammad and his teachings were. And then we had a spiritual meat fest showing how the New Testament, Jesus and his disciples identify Jesus as God in the flesh. Guess what happened? So I need your prayers, guys. I already contested it. I contested it and I appealed to fair use. Guess what they did to my stream yesterday? Destroying Muslim meta retard. Guess what they did to my stream? Because I played... Knowing you, Jesus, that Christian song, the YouTube channel complained, and then YouTube <clears throat> blocked it. So now I contested it. Can you believe it? A channel where I'm playing a Christian song, glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing you, Jesus. They complain. I play music from other channels, secular music. I don't get blocked. I'm just told that the owner of the content is aware. But it's not going to be a strike, and I'm not going to have to do anything. So a Christian channel, because I'm assuming it's Christian, I play a worship song, Knowing You, Jesus. And they complain and had YouTube remove it. I contested it, so I need your prayers. It was an amazing session. Those who heard it, it was amazing. Hilarious. We went through Hadith. It was so hilarious. People were on the floor laughing to show you how stupid a rationalist religion is. And the second part was amazing, the depth of Scripture proving Jesus is God in the flesh. It was truly a blessing from the Lord, and Satan had to mess it up. But I'm contesting it. So plan A is they'll restore it, pray sooner than later. If not, praise the Lord Jesus for Protestant believer. I sent him the link. He downloaded it. So plan B will be he's going to edit out that portion where we're playing Knowing You, Jesus. He's going to edit it out, and we're going to re-upload it. Pray sooner than later because it was a meat fest and people are going to see how stupid Islam is, how beautiful the Lord Jesus Christ is. So we need, we need your prayers. Pray, I get word today, for the glory of the Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. So if they don't do it, we're just going to edit it because I don't want to have to redo it again. It was just a blessing from the Lord. Now with that said, we have Seraphim Hamilton, a young and up and coming Christian theologian, Apologist of the Orthodox faith, highly recommended by the Orthodox, such as <clears throat> I. He's going to be presenting the Orthodox position on the filioque. Filioque. Uh, Mike, you need to get the ladder. You know that, right? Mike, you are, let me say sorry, my brother Cobain. I deal with trolls who are demons, who are tools of the devil, who masquerade as Christians. Here we got a stupid, spiritual, filthy tool of the devil who wants to bark, talking about a so-called problem in 2 Kings, that because he's too stupid and inept, he can't deal with it. 
He wants other people to fight his battles because he's a spiritual dog. So we just muzzled him. Now go back to your vomit, you dumb little spiritual rabid dog. Sorry, Kimbane. I'm trying to pray to be patient like you. Can you pray for me? I'm going to bring him up because I just want to make some announcements. The filthy demons are already manifesting. Guys, you're at the wrong channel. Cabane is a handsome, gracious, patient servant of Jesus Christ, much more knowledgeable than I, but I'm mean, I'm rude, I'm nasty. You bark, I'll muzzle you, and I'll crush your mouth spiritually by the power of the Holy Spirit. Wrong channel to egg me on. All right, now with that said, Cabane is going to give the Orthodox perspective on why the Orthodox do not accept the filioque. Lord Jesus willing, Wednesday, Eric Yabara will be on to give the Roman Catholic perspective on why Roman Catholics accept the filioque. And then, Lord willing, we're working at it. Maybe next week or in two weeks, if the Lord wills, Cabane and Eric Yabara on my channel will come together face to face. God willing, we're going to try to shoot for next week if their schedule allows it, at least within the upcoming weeks. Eric Yabara, Seraphim, Cabane, We'll be together on my channel discussing the filioque in a very gracious, loving manner because they're able to agree to disagree and not vilify and demonize the other, which is what I want. Let me be the one who's the jerk. Let them be the nice guys. Bad cop, good cop. I'll be the bad cop. Now, with that said, let's bring I think I'm dumb. I think I'm dumb. I think I'm happy. That was Cobain, right? Now, let's bring you on, right? Is that the singer's name, Cobain? I don't know. Oh, I have you know no idea. Drum singer who died who committed suicide? Oh, Kurt Cobain, I think. Oh, it's Cobain. Yeah. What's wrong with me, man? Why do I keep thinking Cobain sounds like I used to call you Cabani? So yeah. I mean, now these days I just changed my channel name to Sarah from Hamilton because sure. uh, the only meaning that Cobain actually has is it's some kind of rank of Japanese samurai or whatever and i had no idea when i created it when i was like 12 years old so just to make it more professional and to uh, eradicate the that association i've changed my uh channel name to sarah from hamilton all right now before i hand it over to you and you can lead us in prayer and you can speak as much as time you want then we're going to open up q a i just want to know something sir why is it we have someone a mckenzie here she never comes to my channel but now you're here she's here and she's like yay cabane is here Ah, she's excited for you, brother. Her name is Mackenzie. I don't know who she is. She's never been on my channel, but when she heard Seraphim Hamilton, yay! She's giddy for the fact you're here, sir. But now with that said, brother, I'm going to recede in the background. My mods will keep a tight rein on blasphemers and tools of the devil. Lay out the case for us. Make the case clear. Simplify it because, like I said, I don't know much about these issues. I'm learning and I'm on a journey and I pray the Holy Spirit will work through you to bring me to the fullness of the truth and to the church that he wants me to be planted fully and completely until the Lord summons me. So don't rush, break down the issues and we'll open up the Q&A. So I'm going to recede. God bless you. The Spirit fill you for the glory of Jesus. It's your... Uh, well, I want to begin uh, today by thanking Sam for having me on. Um, and I want to begin with a word of prayer. Illumine our hearts, O Master, who lovest mankind, with the pure light of thy divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of thy gospel teachings, and plant also in us the fear of thy blessed commandments, that trampling down all carnal desires, we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things as are well-pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God. Unto thee do we ascribe glory, together with thy Father, who is everlasting, and then all holy good, and life-creating spirit, both now and ever, to the ages of ages. Amen. Um, so what I'm here to talk about is the uh, orthodox position on the doctrine of the filioque. So the word filioque comes from two Latin words, and it means and the son. So the Nicene Creed, as it was originally composed at the 381 Council of Constantinople, which added an extended section on the Holy Spirit, uh, said, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified. Now, when that was translated into Latin, the Latin word for son uh, is uh, filius, and uh, in conjugated form, it's filio. Uh, but at some point in the latter half of the first millennium, certain Latin theologians began to add the words and the son 
uh, to the section of the creed which spoke of the Spirit's procession. Now, in order to understand what this means, one has to understand really what we're talking about when we talk about the Spirit's procession. The language of the procession of the Holy Spirit is taken from the Gospel of John, where Jesus, speaking of his relation to the Father and the Spirit who is to come, says that the Spirit is the... I don't mean to cut you off, brother. They're saying it's dark in your background. Can you turn the light on? Uh, I can see this light might not work. I can do my best. Yeah, sorry about that, brother. I don't mean to. I don't want to cut you off. I won't do it again, God willing. Hopefully, I won't. They just said it's a little dim. If that's okay, if we can't do anything, and just remember, brother, for me, if you can just go a little more slower for me, because I'm okay. trying to catch up. So thank you. I don't mean to disrupt. Now, guys, sure. focus in Jesus' name. This is the best. We don't have a multi-million dollar organization financing us, so this is the best we can do. Stop complaining. Go ahead, brother. Okay, so uh, I turned on uh, that light. I don't know if that really helps much or whatever, but I don't really have any visual aids today. So um, it's not all that important, I don't think. Um, so anyway, uh, the idea or the doctrine of the filioque is the statement that the spirit proceeds not only from the father, but also from the son. And importantly, this language of the procession of the Holy Spirit from the father and the son takes on a unique connotation when the word filioque is added to the creed. Now, the idea of the procession of the Holy Spirit is considered in the same kind of doctrine that we're considering when we talk about the begetting of the Son. So to understand this, we have to just go to the doctrine of God in general and ask, what do we mean when we say that God exists as Trinity? So God being God is the existent one. He is the one for whom existence is not a contingent reality. It's not something which could or might not be true. Instead, existence belongs to God intrinsically. He is the only one who, in the words of the Lord Jesus, has life in himself. And since you become what you worship, if one worships anyone other than God, if one takes anyone other than God as one's ultimate good, then one falls into mortality and one disintegrates, one begins to die. That God alone has life intrinsically is at the basis of what, we taught, what we're talking about when we say we ought to worship God alone. But God being God and being, uh, having life in himself, uh, all of the qualities which constitute him as God are also necessarily true. Everything that it means for God to be God uh, is true simply by definition. When we understand what we're talking about when we say God is God, then we find that everything contained within the theology of the Trinity is actually implicit in the simple phrase, God exists. So in the Nicene Creed, uh, we begin with the phrase, we believe in one God, the Father. This is taken from 1 Corinthians 8.6, where Paul, looking at the Shema, the, that confession of Israel's monotheism, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. He takes the Shema and he finds the relation of father and son inside of it. He says, for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we for him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and we through him. So at the heart of the biblical revelation is the identity of God as father. And within the idea that God is Father is contained the generation or begetting of the Son. If it is true that God's fatherhood is not simply an accidental quality which he has, if it's true that God as God is Father and God does not need the creation, then necessarily there must be an eternal Son because God always being God, if that Godhood means he is Father, he must always beget the Son. So this is called the doctrine of the eternal generation of the Son. Generation is simply taken from the Greek word for begetting. And it simply means that there is one God who is Father. And to say that he is Father is to say there is one God, the Father of the only begotten Son. Many people ask questions about this doctrine, uh, wondering whether it means that the Son has a beginning in time. 
But it's important to understand that when we talk about relations like this, even when we're talking about created reality, when we say source or even beginning, we're not always talking about things which are true only in time. A classic example is the idea of a river. A river always has a source, and the source gives rise to everything which flows from it. Yet the source of the river, in being what it is, in being the source of the river, always gives rise to the river. And the river, by its very nature, always depends upon its source. Importantly, uh, importantly the source of the river is constituted as what it is because a river flows from it. And likewise, the river is constituted as what it is because it depends upon the source. And yet we do not say that the river gives rise to the source, but that the source gives rise to the river. So there is both a mutual interdependence here in that the source and the river constitute each other as what they are, and there, but there is also a um, imbalance in that we say that the source gives rise to the river and not the other way around. This is what we're talking about when we talk about the eternal generation of the son and the monarchy of the father. Because there is one God, and because that one God is the father, it is included in his identity that he begets the one and only son. And because sonship is implicit in the idea of fatherhood, the son, after a fashion, is necessary to constitute the one God as one God, the Father. Nevertheless, we speak of the one God, the Father, as the source of the Son and not the other way around. So I want you to remember this principle here, that the Son, after a fashion, is necessary for God to be the Father, and yet we do not speak of the Son as the source or the cause of the Father's fatherhood. Um, and this is the this is essential to understand because when we speak about the Holy Spirit, when we speak about the third divine person, there is a quality which constitutes him as the third divine person, as the Spirit, and not as the Father, and not as the Son. So, what is it that constitutes God the Father as God the Father? Well, it's the fact that he is what. Uh, uh, what the classical Christian tradition calls ingenerate, means unbegotten. He is the source and the cause of the whole Godhead. God self-exists as the father of the one and only son and as the source of the person of the Holy Spirit. That self-existence is realized in the communion of the three divine persons. And each divine person has a distinct mark which sets them apart from the other two persons. So the son's distinct quality, which marks him out and distinguishes him as the son, is the fact that he is generate from the father. He is begotten of the father. He is God because he receives the divine nature from the father. And he is the son because that divine nature exists and is realized in the unique mode of relation that he has with the father. And now we turn to the person of the Holy Spirit. The same fundamental principle holds true here. In the Gospel of John, which unveils and opens up the theology of the Trinity, which reveals God as the Father of the only begotten Son, and the Father and the Son as interior to each other, they indwell one another, the same Gospel reveals the truth about the person of the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus, in speaking of the relation that he has to the Father, and of the promise of the Holy Spirit who will come and draw Father and Son together, into the life of the believing community, says the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. Procession is the key word that is used in the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. 
So to be clear, when I call it the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, most of us just call it the Nicene Creed, because the section of the creed which speaks of the generation of the sun was written in 325 at the first ecumenical council, the Council of Nicaea. In 381, the second ecumenical council, uh, it added an extended section on the spirit where it was said that the spirit proceeds from the father. So if the father is father, because he has his divine nature in a way which is ingenerate, that is self-existent. And if the son is God the son, because he has his divine nature through generation from the father, the spirit is the person of the Holy Spirit because of the way in which he receives his divine nature. He receives that divine nature from the Father by means of procession. But I want to lay down a point here, which is going to be very important as we walk through this topic. When the Lord Jesus speaks of the procession of the Spirit, he calls him the Spirit of Truth. Now, in the Gospel of John especially, the word truth has a special Christological significance. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It is the Son, the Logos of God, who is the truth. Because as he is the Logos, as God speaks all things about himself to and in the person of the Son, and as all things which are true are true because they are derived in one way or another from God, truth is a special name for the person of the Son because of his being the word and logos of God. In the Gospel of John also, Jesus speaks of the Father seeking true worshipers who worship God in spirit and in truth, worship the Father in the Holy Spirit and in Christ. So when Jesus says that the Spirit proceeds from the Father, the Spirit who proceeds from the Father is the Spirit of truth or the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of the Son. Now, I want you to remember that because I'm going to return to this point later in this discussion, as I think this is uh, uh, perhaps the hinge on which the entire argument about the filioque depends. So when we consider God's godhood, there is one God, and he is self-existent. It's not as if he could not exist. That God who is self-existent self -existent, is the Father, and as the Father, he is the Father of the only begotten Son, who also gives rise to the person of the Spirit by procession. Now, I'm going to turn to the historical arguments and the questions about how this uh, theology develops through time in a few moments, but I want to return to the person of the Spirit and explore what we mean when we say he is the spirit of truth or the spirit of the son or the spirit of the father and the son. Why is it that the one God who is self-existent self-exists as Trinity? Why does he not simply self-exist as a twofold personal reality? Why not just father and son? Well, in order to get into this, you really do need to have some grasp of what we're talking about and we talk about the doctrine of the divine energies. Now, the doctrine of the divine energies is often perceived to be something of an esoteric doctrine. Some people hear the word energies of God, and they think immediately of uh, kind of pseudo or uh, pseudo mysticism or the new age movement or something like that. They think it sounds like something you would hear when Deepak Chopra is talking to you. But I want to emphasize that the doctrine of the divine energies is not a particularly esoteric doctrine. That impression really results from the fact that we're translating this Greek word energia as energies, and it has certain resonances in English that it really ought not to have if we're trying to capture the sense of the Greek language here. To talk about the doctrine of the divine energies is to talk about the doctrine of the divine actualities. So, this is going to get a bit technical, but as C.S. Lewis says, we're all grown-ups here. Um, you know, if you want a, a simple religion, well, that's boys' religion. So I'll do my best to try to uh, make it intelligible, but we can't really avoid getting technical to some degree. Uh, the doctrine of the divine energies 
is the doctrine of divine actualities. Okay, the word energia is simply the word Aristotle uses for actuality, as in act and potency. So a potential thing, a thing which has certain potencies, potencies are things which could be true about something, but are not yet fully realized. So we might say that a cup of coffee has the potency of being hot. That is, coffee being what it is can acquire the quality of heat. But a cold cup of coffee, though it is potentially hot, is not actually hot. It does not at present have that quality. Now, in the sense that a thing, uh, in the sense of potency where we say a thing could have certain qualities intrinsic to its being, that is, a good cup of coffee is a hot cup of coffee, certain qualities which are intrinsic to its being but are not yet realized, in that sense, we say that God has no potencies because God is the source of all existence. God is the source of everything that is. He gives everything all of the qualities that it has because God has the root of those qualities intrinsically as the one who has all perfections. He is infinitely actual. He is infinitely real. Sometimes when we think about the doctrine of God's incorporeality, that he has a no body, we tend to imagine in our minds some kind of gaseous substance. That is, you know, the world is concrete and real and thick, and God is kind of ethereal and, and not really that thick. And so he's less than a body, at least implicitly in the mental images that we create. But for the Bible, God is God has no body because he's infinitely more concrete than embodied reality. God is the rock of ages, the one who is infinitely thick. So if you think of the quality of blueness, God has more blueness than you could ever conceive possible. And this is true for all of God's qualities. God is infinitely actual because everything it could mean for a property to exist is true about God. He has all of those properties. So we say that there are uh, an infinite range of actualities in the mind of God. He thinks all truths at once. And thus, everything which is contingent, that is, everything which does not have to exist, uh, uh, depends on God by derivation. There are blue things in the world because God gives some of his own blueness to things in creation. So these are actualities or energies. These are God's modes of self-realization in the sense that what does it mean for God to exist? Well, he has all of these existent qualities. They realize things which are true of God because he possesses and is a subsistence or mode of existence of the divine nature. So the energies are uh, qualities which God has as the existent one. And he has those energies because they are realizations of his nature. And God being God, what it means for him to be of divine nature, well, that means that all things which could be true of God are fully and infinitely true of God. Now, I want you to consider the nature of any quality. Consider the nature of blueness, for example. Blueness is something that you see. And this is why the word which we translate as actuality is also translated as activity. Actuality and activity. You can see even in the English language, these words are related to each other. So what, is, uh, what does it imply to say that there is such a thing as blueness? Well, the blueness is being shined or shown on something or someone, and it is also being received by something or someone. Okay, so to talk about any kind of thing you can see is to talk about a relation between two distinct subjects. The only begotten Son eternally beholds the glory of the Father, and the glory of the Father is realized as glorious because it is something beheld 
by the only begotten Son. Or consider the quality of love. What is love? In Orthodox Christianity, we speak of love as a divine energy, a divine actuality, a divine activity, because love is something which one person uh, engages it in in relation to another person. The Father, being God, is infinitely loving, but for him to be infinitely loving requires there to be more than one divine person. And that divine person who receives his love is the only begotten Son. Father generates the son, begets the son, because that generation is intrinsic to his being God. And as those qualities which distinguish him and mark him out as God are qualities which can only exist in relation, God's godhood is realized only in the relation between these persons. So if you're following me so far, um, there is one God. He self-exists as the father. As the Father, he begets the Son, and the ways in which he exists are called energies, actualities, or activities. And for each activity, what it means for it to be itself requires or presupposes there to be a relation between more than one divine person. These actualities, these activities, both uh, realize and manifest God as uniquely God. So just consider, for example, the uh, activity of blueness. How is it that you know you're seeing something which is blue? Well, to know that you're seeing something which is blue actually requires you to already have that thing, in a sense. If you didn't know what blue is, you wouldn't actually be able to see it and pick it out and recognize it for what it is. A person who can see blue is someone who already possesses the knowledge of what blueness is. And this is why for the father to realize and make himself manifest totally, to reveal all of the qualities which he has, which the, and that revelation is in fact part of what it means for him to have those qualities, the one to whom he shows himself totally must be of the same nature because the energies which are being revealed are manifestations, realizations of this nature. And one must already have those energies in order to perceive them outside of oneself. So the sun is called the logos of God because all things which are true about God are spoken to and in him. The father reveals himself completely and totally in his infinite love and self-disclosure to the sun. And the sun is uniquely capable of apprehending the totality of divine nature because he himself has that same nature by derivation from the Father. He receives it by begetting. So again, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, the Father has given it to the Son to have life in himself. And this, on its face, is quite a striking passage. He has given it to the Son to have life in himself. Now, when we think of what it means to be given something, we would usually imagine that to be contrary to the idea of having it in oneself. And yet, it belongs to the very nature of their relationship that the son has it in, uh, receives it by gift from the father, and that which he receives is something he totally possesses in himself. And now we turn to the person of the Holy Spirit and we can raise and hopefully get some answer to the question of what the relation of the Holy Spirit is to both God the Father and God the Son. So the Spirit is sometimes described as the gift of God. He is the gift and consider again that phrase that we just heard, the Father has given it to the Son to have life in himself. And consider the nature of what love is. Love requires a multiplicity of divine persons. And all of the actualities, all of those qualities which are fully and totally real in God, in order to be themselves, must be revealed. Okay, so the revelation of those qualities actually makes them what they are. If they can't be revealed, they can't be themselves. 
And because it is intrinsic to God that all qualities which could exist are fully true about him, all of the qualities which are intrinsic to God must be fully revealed within the communion of the three divine persons. So now consider the nature of love. We say in the Orthodox tradition that the Father gives the Son the person of the Holy Spirit. And the person of the Holy Spirit is received by the Son, and the Son reciprocates that gift to his Father in eternal and complete thanksgiving. So this relation is the pattern for all virtuous relations in creation. Adam's fundamental sin, according to St. Paul, was not giving thanks to God. The word for Eucharist means to give thanks. It is our thanksgiving to God. We receive gifts from God and we use them to his glory and honor and give them back to God in thanksgiving. So the Father produces the person of the Son by begetting. He produces the person of the Holy Spirit by procession. The Spirit derives his nature and divinity from the Father. But the person of the Holy Spirit uh, whom the Father produces, is produced to be given as gift to the person of the Son. And the Son, having received him from the Father, gives him back to the Father. And so the Holy Spirit uh, uh, relates the two divine persons, having been derived from the Father for the Son. St. Seraphim of Sarav says the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and rests in the Son. So consider the nature of love. I'm going to try to explain why three divine persons and not merely two are necessary for realizing God as fully and infinitely God. Consider as an analogy, and creation is filled with analogies of God because God created the world and it reflects him from top to bottom. Consider in creation the relationship among the persons of a family. Family language is naturally suited to revealing or analogizing the kinds of things which are true about God, because as St. Paul says, all fatherhood in heaven and on earth is named from the fatherhood of God in relation to the Son. Okay, so family language is uniquely appropriate to speaking about what's going on here in the idea of communion. Um, father and mother are... Uh, meant to love their children. Okay? So a father and a mother, being what they are, can only be good, can only realize themselves as good parents if they love their children. But consider the kind of thing which a child experiences when the relationship between his parents is severed, if they get divorced or separated or something like that. The kind of experience which the child has even as he is loved by his father and his mother separately, is an experience of trauma. Why is it that the child experiences the relation of, to his father and mother in such a deficient way when his father and mother are separated, even though they both individually love their children? Well, it is because love, to be fully realized as love, must not merely reveal the love of one person for one other person, but rather communion itself must be revealed. So this is why I think there are three divine persons and not two divine persons. Because the Father discloses himself totally and completely to the person of the Son. And one of the things which is intrinsically true about divine life, that very divine life which is revealed by God, is the truth that life is communion. So consider the hypothetical situation where there are only two persons. The Father reveals himself to the Son. The Son reveals himself to the Father in return. But if communion belongs to the very quality of God's being God, then how is communion itself revealed? And since revelation is necessary for these qualities to be what they are, how can the quality of communion exist in the first place? I'm sorry if you can hear the dog. I, dogs 
sometimes bark terribly. Um, uh, the father reveals himself to the son. It is one person disclosing himself to one person. And the son returning that revelation to the father is again, one person revealing himself to one person. But if the father in giving himself totally to the son does so through joining his love with the Holy Spirit and disclosing himself to the Son through the Spirit, then the quality of communion, the quality of interrelationship, and the quality of mutual love is itself something which is revealed and therefore actualized in the relation among all three divine persons. And thus, the one God who is Father fully and totally exists through the Son and the Spirit because the Son and the Spirit are intrinsic when you get down to brass tacks and realize the implications of what we mean when we say God is Father. The Son and the Spirit are implicit within God's fatherhood. And we still speak of a taxis or order of one person uh, the first person, the second person, the third person. You can't just swap the Son and the Spirit out from each other as if they're interchangeable. Because the Father begets the Son. That's what it means to say he's Father. And the Son whom he begets is the beloved Son. And the Father's love for the Son is communicated to him by the person of the Spirit. So one way to speak of this is to say that the spirit proceeds from the father alone, but the spirit who proceeds from the father alone is the spirit of the son because he is produced by God the father by procession and in virtue of proceeding rather than being begotten. He is not a second son or a grandson. He is a unique divine person. Uh, uh, he is produced by the person of the Father by procession, but the reason he is produced is for the Son. He is produced as the gift of the Father for the Son. And the Son, having received the Holy Spirit, re uh, receives that Spirit and by that same Spirit gives thanks to God the Father in love. And thus is there a balance in the love of the triune God, such that God is fully and infinitely realized as one God in three divine persons. This is why I think in the New Testament, the language of Father, Son, and Spirit is often spoken of in terms of communion among various members of the church, in terms of gifts, in terms of love. 1 Corinthians 12 speaks of the variety of gifts that God gives. It says there is a one God, uh, many gifts, one Lord, that's the Son, many gifts, and one Spirit, many gifts. And so there is a unity, and then there is also a plenitude, a diversity of operations, because this unity and diversity is realized in what we mean when we say that the three divine persons are perfectly in communion with each other. It's produced by the Father for the Son, is given by the Father to the Son, and the Son reciprocates uh, his love for the Father by that same Spirit. So a way to see this in uh, the Gospels, and remember, the only begotten Son becomes incarnate as the only begotten Son of the Father, meaning he reveals the life of the triune God in the life of the human family and thus allows for us to be adopted into that very same life. So he says the church is to be one as you and I are one through the person of the Spirit. The Father speaks to the Son. He says, this is my beloved Son, or you are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Father's love for the Son and his absolute and total delight in the Son is manifest in the gift of the Spirit. And thus we see the Son anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Father bears witness to his love for the Son. The Son now has the Holy Spirit, possesses him as his own. And what happens next is that it is the Spirit who drives the Lord Jesus into the wilderness. And what happens in the wilderness is Jesus, the Son, 
returns the love of the Father to the Father by the Spirit. Because it is in the wilderness that through the Holy Spirit, the Son bears witness and demonstrates the fact that the Father is his supreme treasure in resisting all temptations put on him by the devil through the Spirit who drove him into the wilderness, through the Spirit who carries the Father's love to the Son. And so when the fullness of this Trinitarian communion is realized, Jesus begins uh, the main part of his ministry. And thus, the spirit who dwells in us is the spirit who draws us into the love that the Son has for the Father and discloses to us the love that the Father has for the Son and for all of his children who are adopted into sonship through Jesus Christ. So that is what I would say is the orthodox theology of the Trinity, especially considered in relation to the doctrine of the divine energies. And the doctrine of the energies is essentially an elucidation of what we mean when we say that God is the existent one. Because energies, activities, actualities, these are qualities of existence, which are given to us in salvation and redemption and glorification as we are fully realized as uh, in the natures that God created us with. So what is the idea of the filioque in the sense that Orthodox Christians object to it? Let me begin to answer that question by first stating something that I don't believe the Orthodox objection to the filioque hinges on. The Orthodox object, objection to the filioque is not primarily an argument about canonical niceties. It's not an argument about procedure. So in the first millennium, the undivided church of East and West recited the creed with one voice. The creed in the Eastern church and the Western church was the very same. At some point in the latter part of the first millennium, and in local areas, the words and the sun began to be added to the statement about the procession of the spirit. So instead of the spirit proceeding from the father and being glorified with the father and the son together, the spirit is said to proceed from the father and the son. And some people have seen the principal aspect of the orthodox objection to the filioque as a procedural debate. Orthodox, uh, in, in this view of the debate, uh, the problem is that the Eastern Church wasn't consulted. But I have to say that if that is really the hinge of the argument against the filioque, this is a profoundly childish reason to perpetuate a schism. If the problem is not that this doctrine isn't true, but simply that we should have been asked before Rome added a phrase to its creed only in the local recitation of their own liturgy, this is no reason to tear the unity of the body of Christ. Moreover, this is not at the heart of the historic orthodox theological objection to the filioque. The historic objection to the filioque is based on its theological truth or falsehood, and what the filioque would mean, not only for the spirit, but about what we mean by the persons of the Trinity in general. Second, the orthodox doctrine of the Holy Spirit does not exclude an eternal and unique relationship between the Son and the Holy Spirit. So sometimes the orthodox and Catholic positions on the Spirit's procession are distinguished like this. For Catholics, the argument goes, uh, the Holy Spirit has an eternal relation with the Father and the Son. That is, he proceeds eternally from the Father and the Son, and thus he is given to us by the Father and the Son together. And on this view, the orthodox view is that the Spirit proceeds eternally from the Father, but in time he is given by the Father and the Son together. But on this interpretation of orthodox theology, there's no eternal relation that the Son uniquely has with the person of the Holy Spirit, or as in the Roman Catholic view, there would be. However, this is a misreading of the great majority of the tradition of Orthodox Christian theology. 
And uh, in the thirteenth, um, in the thirteenth century, there was an attempted reunion to forge between the Eastern and Western Church. This reunion was personally negotiated by the emperor with the pope, and the bishops weren't really involved, and so it fell apart. But in response to this uh, failed Council of Union, the Orthodox Church had a council called the Council of Blacherne. Um, and the Council of Blacherne clarified the Orthodox theology of the Holy Spirit by looking to the theology of the Patriarch of Constantinople, Gregory uh, of Cyprus, who interpreted the tradition of the Church of East and West. For Gregory of Cyprus, the difference is not a difference between an eternal relation that the Father has with the Spirit and a temporal relation which the Son has with the Spirit. Rather, the difference between these two positions is one uh, of uh, origin, derivation, and manifestation. So remember what I said early in this discussion. The Son, being the only begotten Son, is necessary for the Father to be the one and only Father, as there is no Father without Son. So in a sense, they are mutually constitutive. And yet, the Son derives his divine nature from the Father. That's what it means for him to be the Son. If that wasn't true, he wouldn't be a Son. I wouldn't be the Son. The Son derives his divine nature from the Father, by begetting, by generation, the Father gives birth to a second divine person who is divine because he receives his nature from the Father. What we do not say, the Son uh, gives rise to the Father. The Father doesn't derive his nature from the Son. The Son derives his nature from the Father. How does he derive it? He does so by begetting, by generation, by being the only begotten Son. So for Gregory of Cyprus and the Council of Black Renee, the fundamental error in the Roman Catholic idea of the procession of the Holy Spirit is that for Roman Catholics uh, and uh, the Western Church of that day, the Spirit derives his divine nature from the Father and the Son together. That is, the Father and the Son are joined together in spirating. You can see spirate means to produce as the person of the spirit, just as begetting is like saying sunning, it's producing a son. The father and the son on this view are together the principle that is the reason that the spirit exists, the one principle by whom the spirit is produced. Now for Gregory of Cyprus, this is not the case. Because the unity of God, because our confession that there is one God, turns on and hinges on the fact that that one God is the Father from whom are derived the Son and the Spirit in relation to each other and to the Father. If the Father and the Son together are producing the person of the Spirit, if the Spirit is derived equally from the Father and from the Son, then even if you say we believe in one principle, this makes there this means that there are two ultimates, two principles of existence: Father on the one hand, the Son on the other, and being joined together, they produce the person of the Spirit. After a fashion, this would make the Spirit a kind of a grandson of the Father and the Son, rather than His own irreducibly unique divine person. For Gregory of Cyprus and the Council of Blacherne, the Spirit eternally manifests the Son. Now, what does this mean, to say he manifests the Son? Well, let's consider what we mean when we say manifestation. Manifestation means that something about you is revealed. I manifest the reality that I'm Sarah from Hamilton and not someone else because my kind of patterns of speech and thought and activity are uniquely my own. Those things which are my own are things that I have by virtue of being a human being, and yet my human qualities are realized in and through my personality. And this is the same, the same is true of the persons of the triune God. The son does not have on the one hand divine properties and on the other hand properties which make known his sonship. Instead, those things which reveal him as the son are modes by which divine existence is manifest. So God the Father is God in a fatherly way. God the Son is God in a filial or son-like way. God the Holy Spirit is God in a spiritual way. The divine qualities are always realized through 
the distinctness of the three divine persons. Now, God's Trinitarian life is a life of communion, and communion is all about manifestation, mutual revelation, speaking to each other after a fashion. And to say the Spirit manifests the Son is to say that the person of the Holy Spirit, being the means by whom, uh, by which, or by whom the Father loves the Son, and being the means by whom the Son returns that love to the Father, the Spirit reveals the common divine nature, the common divine quality and existence which all three persons have together, and the Spirit also reveals the unique rhythm according to which these divine qualities exist. There are a number of analogies we can use, I think, to capture this way of speaking. Uh, I hope at least one of them is, is helpful. Uh, but one, one analogy which I like is the uh, relationship of, uh, of lyrics to um, tune. Let's just say for the sake of the analogy that we, at uh, the lyrics or the words of a song correspond to the person uh, or, or, or to the son. And we might say then the tune corresponds to the person of the Holy Spirit. That is, the son is the one in whom all of these truths about God are disclosed. And the person of the Holy Spirit reveals the manner in which these truths are true about God. So uh, there are divine qualities. These divine qualities are always revealed in terms of an idiom, in terms of a particular way of being, as no nature exists without persons. Natures only exist in persons. Persons are um, uh, realizations, manifestations, modes of subsistence or existence of natures. Um, and uh, the idiom or way of being belongs in three different ways to the three different divine persons. So the spirit being the one uh, in whom the father loves the son and in whom the son gives thanks to the father, the spirit reveals all three ways in which God is God, all three tunes, which are nevertheless tunes that are uh, that realize or manifest the same lyrics or the same words. I hope that is at least partially helpful. I know this is a pretty intense uh, subject. Um, so the person of the Holy Spirit eternally manifests the Son, the Son of the Father, because he is given by the Father to the Son, and thus as the one through whom the Father gives himself to the Son, he sings out or speaks out the Father's way of being, speaks out his fatherhood, he speaks out his own way of being as the person of the Holy Spirit and being received by the Son and uh, being the one through whom the Son returns that love to the Father, he speaks out or sings out the Son's way of being as well. So this is what is true in the inner life of God. And the Spirit as the one who is the means of communion and mutuality between Father and Son, the Spirit is thus associated in Scripture with love. He's associated with relationships. Consider that uh, um, in Genesis chapter 6, when we see these false marriages being contracted, a false way of human persons relating to each other, God says, my spirit will no longer strive with man. The spirit is the one who creates all relationships. And when these relationships are false ones, are distorted, the spirit eventually ceases to strive with man. He ceases to give them the power to create these relationships. Or in Romans chapter 5, the love of God is poured into our hearts in Christ through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Galatians speaks of the spirit of the Son. Why? What is the context? The spirit of the Son is the spirit by whom the Son prays Abba Father. And we know from the Gospels that that prayer was prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, that moment where the Son embraced the Father as his supreme good and treasure, whose will he would always unfailingly carry out. The Spirit, in other words, is the one who reveals what the Father-Son relationship means, and thus he is the one who draws us into that relationship. This theology was also elucidated by one of the great theologians and fathers of the Orthodox Church, St. Gregory Palamas, 
who is associated with the doctrine of the divine energies and of the distinction between God's essence, that is what makes him God, and his energies, that is what realizes the fact that he is God. They always have to go together. Essence does not exist without energy, and energy depends upon essence, and yet they are not identical to one another. Gregory Palamas is the one who defended that tradition of the church in the 14th century AD, though he was simply drawing on and elucidating language of the ecumenical councils. For example, the sixth ecumenical council, the third council of Constantinople. A third council of Constantinople says that Christ has both two natures and two energies. Well, if nature and energy are the same thing, it doesn't make sense to, uh, to state those doctrines distinctly from one another. Uh, Gregory Palamas, in his... Um, elucidation of orthodox theology in a book called the 150 chapters in chapters 35 and following he explores what it means for the spirit to be the one through whom the father's fatherhood is revealed to the son and the spirit to be the one through whom communion is made possible and through whom communion is realized palamas explored this doctrine in particular because the doctrine of the divine energies is a doctrine which is fundamentally about communion it's a doctrine about how God exists as God, who is communion. And it's a doctrine about how we can be drawn into God without becoming identical with God, without being assimilated or absorbed into his essence. So that which is shared with us in the divine energies are, is shared with us through the Holy Spirit, who shares the life of the Father and the Son together. So this is the orthodox theology of the Holy Spirit. What is the Roman Catholic position and what is the problem with it? So when the history of the Filioque has been uh, given, uh, it is often stated that the doctrine of the Filioque began as a response to Arianism. That is, it's that heresy which says that the Son is a created being and thus is not God in the same way that the Father is God. And very often, the first example of the Filioque being included in the creed is identified as being at the 589 Council of Toledo. However, there are problems with the manuscript tradition in the Council of Toledo. There is some evidence that, in fact, it was not originally in the manuscript of the Council. Now, why did this happen? Well, if you just think about the way that we transmit um, a text through time, it doesn't actually require any special malice. So sometimes when there's a similar passage in two Gospels, uh, but that are slightly different. We find that early manuscripts of the New Testament will uh, sometimes change a reading in one gospel to conform with the reading in another. So uh, this commonly happens when a reading in Mark is adjusted to match a reading in Matthew. That's because Matthew is the one you're most familiar with when you're just copying something down and you're familiar with something that's very much like this phrase, but you see something different. It's easy to accidentally uh, just write down what you're more familiar with or to assume that there's a mistake here because you've misremembered it um, and to alter the text accordingly. Well, if you're used to reciting the creed with the filioque and you're not familiar with the fact that actually this is something which was added in later, and then you're transmitting the manuscript in the Council of Toledo, uh, it's easy to see how a scribe would have simply added in and the sun. Now, I'm, saying, I'm not saying there was never any malice. There clearly were intentional forgeries, which played a large role in the schism between East and West. But you can also explain certain things without appealing to malice. But what I want to focus on here, regardless of what the situation about the Council of Toledo ultimately ends up being, is the theological justification, which is said to uh, uh, have required the filioque. So what is the theological justification? To say that the procession of the Spirit from the Father and the Son together refutes Arianism, is to gain the divinity of the Son, but to undermine the divinity of the Holy Spirit. So here's the basic logic. If God the Father, as God, is consubstantial with the Son, and thus shares all that he has with the Son in his nature, well then if it is true that the Spirit proceeds from the Father, the Father should also share the fact that uh, of the Spirit's procession from him with the Son, and thus the Spirit proceeds in the Father and the Son. But what this ends up doing in the logic of this argument is making the identification of a person as being the source of the Holy Spirit a feature of that nature 
which is shared in common among the persons of the Trinity and which constitutes God as God. So if it is the case that being the source of the Holy Spirit is something the Son possesses because he is of one nature, of one essence, consubstantial with the Father, the Spirit cannot be the source of himself. The Spirit doesn't proceed from himself. So how can we then say that the Holy Spirit is consubstantial with both the Father and the Son together? One seems to gain a certain theological advantage, but one loses the doctrine of the Trinity and its inner logic and consistency in the process of seeking to gain that advantage. But however this doctrine came, into the, came to the fore in the Western church, it became clear to theologians in the Eastern church during the latter half of the first millennium that there seemed to be some kind of problem. And the problem is uniquely associated, especially with the inclusion of this phrase in the creed. Because when the creed is speaking about the Trinitarian persons, it is speaking of them in the context of identifying what makes them who they are. The father is the father because he is ingenerate. The son is the son because he is generate. The spirit is the spirit because he proceeds. That's what the word procession means in the context of the creed. Now, if one says, and the son, in the context of the creed, then what one is saying, because of what procession means in this theological context, is that the spirit actually receives his divine nature from the father and the son together. Yet because these properties, these hypostatic properties, are what distinguish and set apart the divine persons from each other, those qualities in themselves cannot be shared. In fact, they are the very things which are not shared. I share my humanity with others. I cannot communicate the, uh, my own being myself to others in such a way that they take on the property of what actually makes me who I am. Um, so the hypostatic properties are not communicated. This is so if you read St. Basil the Great, one of the great theologians who defended the Council of Nicaea, St. John of Damascus, one of the theologians who exposited the systematic nature of the Christian faith and was a critic of early Islam. Uh, what they say is that uh, the father is father because he's ingenerate. The son is the son because he's generate from the father. Spirit is the spirit because he proceeds from the father. And what is the difference between generation and procession? They say that the difference is in the mode of relation to the father. And the exact nature of that difference is beyond comprehension because to comprehend it would mean that in fact we do enter into the um the reality of what it means to constitute god as the son we do enter into that hypo hypostatic property um so you don't have to follow everything i just said in order to follow the main points here i'm sure there's a better way to say that um Uh, so by this latter part of the first millennium, it was becoming clear to many in the Eastern church that there was potentially an issue here. And so we see this um, uh, several times throughout uh, church history. It's sometimes said that this was only a problem after the schism and the Eastern church retroactively used the filioque to justify their schism from Rome. But if you look at the history of, the, of this controversy, it becomes clear that this is in fact not the case. And I want to point to one passage in particular as the hinge on which this discussion revolves in terms of who represents the normative tradition of East and West. And this is a passage from St. Maximus the Confessor. St. Maximus the Confessor is one of the greatest theologians to have ever lived in church history. St. Maximus the Confessor lived in Rome for much of his life despite being from the Eastern Church. Consequently, he was proficient in both Greek and Latin. And some of the translation issues um, create confusion between Eastern and Western churches about what exactly is meant by these particular terms. St. Maximus the Confessor is in Rome because there is a controversy at this point in time uh, about the whether Christ is a two wills, one energy or two energies. And Rome was on the right of this. And then in the Eastern part of the church, there were various different opinions, but some of the major patriarchal churches were in heresy at this point in time. So St. Maximus the Confessor is in Rome and he receives a letter from people in the East. And in the East, he hears that people are concerned 
not only because of the Christological controversy, but also because of a curious phrase that they saw in a letter from the Roman church. And apparently what they objected to was this statement that the spirit proceeds from the father and the son. Uh, and the word that is used for procession is the word that is used in the Nicene Creed. So what Maximus says is very, very important here. Because what St. Maximus is doing here is he is spelling out the exact boundaries of what constitutes Orthodox and Catholic doctrine on the subject. He is saying, in other words, that if you go beyond these boundaries, you are by implication in heresy. More importantly, I think he's defending the Roman church. And we have to remember, this is the seventh century, East and West are in communion here. From an Orthodox point of view, the Western church here is part of the Orthodox church. So to say that uh, the Eastern and Western churches were already fundamentally opposed on this subject, I think would be a serious mistake. So the fact that St. Maximus is interpreting the witness of both Greek and Latin fathers, whose languages he can read, is very, very important here. And this is what he says. He says that the Romans of his day do not make the Son the cause of the Spirit, for they know that the Father is the one cause of the Son and the Spirit, the one by begetting and the other by procession. But they show the manifestation through him and thus the unity of the essence. Okay, so very importantly here, he says, Orthodox teaching on this subject is that the Son is not the cause of the Spirit. The Father is the one cause of the Son and the Spirit. He's the cause of the Son by generation, by begetting. He's the cause of the Spirit by spiration, uh, by procession. Uh, I see someone uh, says that the authenticity of this letter is highly disputed. Uh, it was condemned at a forgery, as a forgery at the Council of Florence. I'll get to the Council of Florence in a few moments. I'll only say that uh, the authenticity of this letter today is not universally acknowledged. If you want to look at the this letter in more detail, I would recommend reading a, um, the dissertation of, uh, uh, of Edward Sosensky, Sosensky, I think is how you pronounce his name, which is on this uh, the theology of St. Maximus the Confessor and its use at the Council of Florence. He also wrote a book called The Filioque, uh, which I would recommend. Um, in any case, what is the logic of what St. Maximus says here? Okay, so the spirit is the spirit because he proceeds from the father. And yet the spirit is said to process through the son and manifest the son and thus reveal the unity of the divine essence. Okay, so energies, actualities, are realizations and manifestations of the essence. They are manifestations of the essence by divine persons. And the way in which um, these energies are manifest turns on the uniqueness of each divine person. Now, because the spirit is given by the Father to the Son and returns to the Father from the Son, the Holy Spirit manifests the sonship of the Son because he reveals these divine qualities in their three distinct personal modes. He reveals the divine qualities as fatherly qualities or as qualities that are revealed in a fatherly way, in a son-like way, and in a spiritual way. That's what he discloses. So he reveals both that God is totally one because he's manifesting the uh, those energies of each divine person, and thus he reveals that each of them have the same energies, and he reveals that they're threefold, because the three ways in which these qualities are realized are in a fatherly, son-like, and spiritual way. So the Holy Spirit reveals that God is one, and he reveals that God is three, because he proceeds from the Father, rests in the Son, returns to the Father. Now, this passage is very important for a number of historical reasons, this passage, in fact, was a major point of controversy at the Council of Florence. At the Council of Florence, or the Council of Florence was a, a very important attempted reunion council, which took place uh, very shortly prior to the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks. For several centuries, the Eastern Church had been pleading with the Romans to hold an ecumenical council where they could actually discuss and hash all of these issues out. If you read the letters that the Eastern bishops were writing to the Romans, it's very clear they, in principle, regarded the schism as a tragedy, as something which they hoped to overcome by a free and open discussion of the issues. 
However, for a number of centuries, the popes of Rome had refused to allow this council to take place. It was regarded as inappropriate in part to uh, discuss an issue that they already considered to be settled. Uh, and it was seen by some popes as impinging on the implications of papal authority. So there's a great history of this in Sachensky's book, uh, The Papacy and the Orthodox. And he includes lots of, uh, of passages from um, otherwise untranslated documents. So I really recommend people interested in the history to study that book. Um, the first attempted reunion council, we've already mentioned, the Second Council of Lyon, but it was just personally negotiated with the Pope and the Emperor. The second major reunion council was the Council of Florence. And here there was a much more detailed analysis and discussion of the issues. A number of things were revealed at uh, the Council of Florence. One of the things that the participants in the council discovered was that the East and West actually had very different versions of a number of patristic texts. So during the um, analysis of the patristic texts and their various manuscript traditions, it was shown that the Western uh, versions of these manuscripts were in many cases um, marred by interpolations. That is where a writer, uh, where you have a manuscript where it includes passages which the writer didn't originally put to pen. Um, this made many of the Eastern representatives quite cynical about relying on Western patristic texts. Um, I mean, this is not really a matter that is open for dispute. If you just read Thomas Aquinas's Against the Errors of the Greeks, almost all of those quotations are regarded by uh, uh, historians today as forgeries, and almost no Catholic scholar, including the very conservative ones, would really dispute that today. And that was one of the things that was revealed. But when the, uh, when the Eastern representatives talked about the Filioque, they pointed to this text from the letter to Marinus which was originally, by the way, cited by the Latin representatives as a proof that Rome was not in heresy because, look, Maximus defended Rome. Of course, the Rome he was defending was a Rome which had existed several centuries earlier. However, it became clear to even the Latin representatives that what Maximus was saying here was outside the boundaries of what the Roman church considered by that time to be Catholic orthodoxy. So the Orthodox representatives of the Council of Florence focused on this particular phrase that uh, the Romans of his day, of Maximus's day, do not make the son the cause of the spirit. They know that the father is the one cause of the son and the spirit, the one by begetting and the other by procession. Now for the Roman Catholic Church, the father is the primary cause of the spirit, but he gives to the son the secondary role of also causing the person of the spirit. And if the role of being cause of the spirit is something which is given by father to son, well, then what cause means in both cases has to be identical. So in fact, at the Council of Florence, when it issued its statement on the filioque, it said that by cause, we mean what the Greeks mean by idea which is the Greek word that was used in technical Trinitarian theology for cause. I mean, there were Greek and Latin speakers at this council. Florence knew what it was saying when it made this statement. And yet Maximus does not say that the father is primary cause, but the son is secondary cause, uh, but that uh, the son is not the cause or source of the spirit. Spirit does not receive his divine nature from the, uh, uh, the Spirit does not receive his divine nature from the Father and the Son. Rather, the Spirit receives his divine nature from the Father, and his way of being is the gift of Father to the Son. What is especially striking, however, about the Council of Florence is the phraseology that the authors of the final documents used to affirm the filioque. According to the, the Council of Florence, the Holy Spirit is eternally from the Father and the Son. He has his nature and subsistence, that is his being, at once from the Father and the Son. He proceeds eternally from both, as from one principle, and through one spiration. And it says that the Son is the cause of the Spirit together with the Father, according to the Greek word, Aetia. 
And actually, if you compare the language of the letter to Marinus to the language used by the, uh, uh, by the Roman representatives in the dogmatic definitions of the council, you find that they were actually specifically using the language of the letter to Marinus. This statement of what both East and West in Maximus's day confessed as essential to Orthodox Christian faith, they used that language and specifically negated it as to say, we do not believe what this letter says. And they accused the Greeks uh, of, of forging uh, the letter. Um, and so this is extremely telling, I think, because the essential question which we're asking when we consider Orthodox and Catholic theology is who has the claim to be the legitimate heir of the totality of the tradition of the undivided church of East and West? The Orthodox church does not claim merely to be the heir of the Eastern church of the first millennium, nor does the Roman Catholic church merely claim to be the heir of the Western church. Rather, the Orthodox Church claims to be the unique heir of the fullness of the Christian tradition held by both Eastern and Western Church in the first millennium. That is precisely the tradition that Maximus the Confessor was speaking in defense of, saying not only this is what the East says, not only this is what the West says, but this is what Greek and Latin fathers together bear witness to. And it is that very statement of the unity of faith existing between East and West, which was negated by Rome in the Council of Florence. I think one way that you can see the change that had occurred between first and second millennia here is just by looking at the way that Thomas Aquinas articulates the doctrine of the spirit's procession. You'll remember that Maximus, together with Basil the Great, John of Damascus, and many other fathers, say that the distinction between son and spirit is that the one is begotten, the other proceeds. The distinction between begetting and procession is in the mode of origin from the father, and that the exact difference between those modes is ineffable. It transcends human understanding. Thomas Aquinas, in giving an argument for the filioque, says not this. Instead, he says that the difference between generation and procession, from begetting and procession, is in the number of persons involved. That is, the son is begotten because it is a relation he has with the father alone. What makes begetting different from proceeding? Well, proceeding differs from begetting because the spirit has the relation, this relation with father and son, whereas the son has this relation only with the father. Now, this is a mutually exclusive statement with what Maximus, John of Damascus, Basil the Great, and many other fathers said. It cannot be true if what these fathers said were true. And yet this is the view of the Holy Spirit that Aquinas articulated and which the Council of Florence, I would argue, endorsed. Now, I uh, want to make just one final note here about the early part of the second millennium. Now, we say in Orthodoxy that we are the heir of the tradition of both East and West. The schism between East and West uh, was a schism which, of course, both in a sense happened somewhat gradually and was realized somewhat gradually. So you would not expect everyone in the Western church to immediately reverse positions just like that um, if in fact the Western church at one point was fully orthodox. This is, you can see this, for example, in the case of the papacy. Uh, there was a very long struggle to impose total papal control over the entire Western church. Uh, many parts of the Western church continued to say that ecumenical councils were superior to popes and could overrule popes. This is the so-called Gallican controversy because the Gallican church continued to affirm the church's traditional teaching about the relation of pope to council. Well, I would say the same thing would make sense if it were true of the procession of the Holy Spirit. If the Western church taught the legitimate orthodox doctrine of the Spirit's procession at one point before the schism, one wouldn't expect that to just disappear the moment the schism happens. And so you do find in the early part of the second millennium, that many members of uh, certain Western theological schools disagreed with the way that Thomas Aquinas formulated the filioque. Uh, the members of the Franciscan theological tradition arguably had a doctrine of the Holy Spirit, which was much closer to the Orthodox teaching than was the uh, doctrine of the Dominican school, who largely followed Thomas Aquinas. But the important point for our purposes today is simply that the Council of Florence took that tradition 
which Maximus said was held in common by East and West, and specifically negated it in his exact words. So um, whatever was held by a number of theologians in the early part of the second millennium in the West, glory to God, if in fact some of them taught something much closer to orthodoxy. However, it seems to me that as time goes on here, uh, the official magisterial teaching authorities of the Roman church insisted on a formulation of the doctrine of the spirit's procession, which uh, was absolutely contrary, not only to the tradition of the East, but also to the tradition of the Western church. And I think that is really the problem that Roman Catholics have to wrestle with today. And, you know, in the early part of the schism, uh, the filioque was the principal issue. Almost all the time the Council of Florence was spent dealing with the controversy over the filioque. Today, there's a kind of dismissiveness that prevails, even among very good theologians, in my opinion, towards this question, as if the papacy is the only real question we have to deal with. But the doctrine of the Trinity is the source and root of all Christian theology. If it is absolutely essential that we know what we mean when we're talking about the begetting of the Son, if the eternal generation of the Son is fundamental to Christian theology, then this is no secondary issue because we're dealing fundamentally with what we mean when we say the Spirit proceeds. We're dealing with what we mean when we say the Spirit exists as the Holy Spirit. And so I think we really need to spend a lot of energy studying this issue, focusing on this issue, and praying about this issue because I believe with St. Philard of Moscow that God is always working to heal all the wounds that have been inflicted on his body, and we should pray for the end of the schism, but only in truth, and really work towards that. And to work towards that, we have to understand what these issues are about, where we disagree, and why it is that we disagree. So I would enjoin everyone, to the extent that you care about my advice, um, to pray for the end of the schism. Regardless of your own position on these issues, I think we all want it to end in the way that God wants it to end. So God will not act to uh, end it unless we pray for it, unless we care about it. So let's all pray for the schism to end uh, so that the fullness of the Christian faith might be revealed and confessed by all Christians. So that's what I have. Uh, I think questions are now open or whatever. So I'll let Sam um, figure out or do however we want to go about that. Thank all right. You. Yeah. Okay. Well, brothers, don't forget Wednesday, Eric is coming on now. What I was hoping is that there would be a focus on the Orthodox position and that Eric on the Catholic position, bring you guys and then talk about why you disagree. But since you did bring in your criticisms of the Catholic position, that means Eric is going to bring his criticisms of the Orthodox position. But I wanted you guys to be together to discuss the differences, but that's okay. Since you shot the first fire he's gonna to have to come I, I like eric a lot i, I think yeah, no. i think with this with this controversy um the kind of nature of orthodox theology was articulated in dialogue with the west sure. and I, vice versa yeah, that's fine but i just want people to understand when eric comes he's going to not only give the catholic position he may offer criticisms and then i'm going to try to bring these two together that's what i wanted to do and lord willing we'll make that happen hopefully we'll see what their schedules maybe a week from now Two weeks from now, I don't know. It's going to be up to them, their schedules. They're going to come together, and they're going to discuss lovingly, though they disagree passionately, and they may even view the other as a heretic, but at least they can show respect. And that's a lesson for every one of you in the comment section. This is why sometimes I really hesitate to have these sessions, because I get Catholics that manifest, and I got Orthodox that manifest, and I'm an equal opportunist hater. I block everybody. It's like you can't get Catholics and Orthodox, and I'm not saying all of you, glory to God, many of my mods are Catholic and Orthodox, they're respectful, and they love one another, and they agree to disagree, even though they may view the other as a heretic, that's between them and God. But it's like I can't get people just to sit and listen without having to chime in. It's like it's impossible. I, I don't understand it. Because if you're chiming in, you're not listening. And if you're not listening, you're not hearing the other perspective to understand the other perspective so that perhaps you'll be able to understand and appreciate why they see it this way and agree to disagree or maybe see they're right. 
when you are in debate mode or defense mode, you're not listening, man. And then you hinder me because I'm more focused. Sorry, brother, I have to go on this rant. Then I'm more focused on blocking trolls, muzzling dogs who are barking. Then I can't learn. Then I have to go back and rewatch. And then you're robbing me because this is something I want to learn. I want to learn about the filioque. I want to learn why there's this division. I want to learn what the first thousand years of church history taught about it. But I can't listen and benefit because the dogs are out. It's like that song, who let the dogs out? Who, 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 who? Speaking of which, I want to set it up. Now, guys, <clears throat> this will be the time to ask your questions. I'm going to start because I have some questions. I need clarification. And forgive me, brother, if I didn't get your statement because I was busy muzzling people. In the, and they were both Catholics and Orthodox. It wasn't just Orthodox or Catholic. They were dogs from both camps. There's going to be dogs in all camps. May God have mercy on us. Just one clarification so I understood it. And I probably did mishear you because I couldn't listen. I have to go back and re-listen. You said that natures, and I'm not using your exact terminology. I'm just trying to give you the gist. Natures are instantiated in persons because natures exist in persons. So are you using the term nature in a manner in which you wouldn't say rock has nature because a rock is not a person? Could you clarify? Because that's where you threw me off. Like when you said nature are connected to persons, it's persons that have natures and natures do not exist independently of persons. So are using the term nature in a more nuanced sense? Because I would say like rock has existence and in that sense has nature, but it's not a person. So could you clarify? Yeah. So um, hypostasis can be used in a broader sense than would just be translated person. So, you know, with anything which has nature, this principle of the particular is an instantiation of that nature, but it's an instantiation in a particular mode. That's true for things that we wouldn't call persons, right? So if we have dog nature, right, and then we have lots of different dogs, they possess the same nature, and yet there are things which uh, distinguish the mode in which that nature is being realized in this or that animal. So it's a good point that um, when we're talking about this relationship, we're talking about something which is uh, more broadly distributed than just those things which we would, or just those subjects that we would call uh, persons. But just okay. in the context of Trinitarian theology, um, I use the word person there. So there, it's more nuanced because you're referring to the hypostasis. All right, good, excellent. I just need to because I'm trying to learn, and I'm going to have to rewatch this, brother, and I'm going to have to start watching sessions because it doesn't help when I'm the moderator. Second question I want to ask for clarification. Uh, and again, remember, I couldn't listen. I tried my best. But from what I thought I heard is that if the Spirit's deity proceeds from the Father and the Son, then let me rephrase that. <clears throat> This the procession of the spirit from the father alone is essential to guard the unity of the Godhead because you can't have the father and the son being the joint source of the spirit's deity. Now, what if as pushback, just for clarification, and I'm going to use this analogy, but it breaks down and it is not identical to God, but we all use analogies. You can have, for example, a child's nature being communicated because you're talking about communicating the divine essence to the spirit, which is a property of the father, the father as the father, the hypostases of the father. It is his property to beget and to spirate. But if the son shares in that property of spirating the spirit, then we collapse the identity of the father and the son. I think I got that's what you're saying. I was trying to listen. But now what if someone says in creation, in the temporal finite realm, you have a child's human nature being communicated to the child by the father and the mother without making the mother the father or the father the mother and without making the female the male. So then why does it have to be a given that if the father and the son communicate deity to the spirit, somehow this collapses the hypostases so that the father and the son are no longer two hypostases, but somehow it would make them one and the same. If in creation, in temporal creation, in temporal reality, that's not identical to God. The female is still the female. The male is still the male. The father is still the father. The mother is still the mother. Husband and wife are not the same person. And yet both are equally responsible in communicating the human nature to the child. So the male and female uh, uh, 
Remember, it's a li limited temporal. My point is not identical right. because if this is possible in the temporal realm, why would this be impossible for an infinite reality? Okay. Um, so I think the, the key here is about the way in which the tradition articulates the um, uh, the kind of distinguishing mark of each divine person. So within the tradition, the way in which the divine persons are distinct from each other is because of ingeneracy, generacy, procession, and each of those things are related directly to the Father. Um, so, uh, but in the in in creation and in the uh, relation between male and female, uh, male and female are what they are because God gives human nature its being, and that human nature is intrinsically male and female, and that maleness and female have the particular relation that they do not only to each other, but also in relation to children. But I think it's significant that, you know, when we talk about uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are not talking about Father, Mother, and Holy Spirit. Um, we're not talking about God the Father marrying God the Son and thus producing the Spirit um, as a derived person through that way. So I think my answer to that, at least part of the answer to that, would be that that seems to press the biblical language in precisely the way that the Bible consistently refuses to press that language. Rather, when it speaks about the distinguishing mark of the divine persons, what constitutes them as who they are, it seems to always relate that as something they receive directly from the Father, or in the Father's case, of course, his relation to himself as being ingenerate. Um, and if we accept that that is what, that those particular qualities are what distinguish the divine persons as the divine persons, then the logic of the Latin position, which is that the father produces the son and because the son has the same nature as the father has it, uh, he must also give, uh, give rise to the person of the Holy Spirit. That logic is undermined. So I think it's not only, you know, what could you say about these relations in general, but what's the specific logic which undergirds the Latin position as they've articulated it? The specific logic is that this is something that the son receives from the father because of their consubstantiality. Whereas the tradition says that this relation the father has to the spirit is something he has in virtue of his hypostasis. So you could potentially articulate different ways of expressing something which you might call the filioque, which could arguably avoid that charge. And I tried to kind of allude to that briefly at the end of the discussion by pointing there are different theologies of the filioque. Uh, but I think the dogmatic articulation of the way in which that works uh, 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 is something which is excluded by the tradition. And I should also say, I didn't say this in my um, discussion itself, um, that you know the Latin word for procession is in itself broader than the Greek language that is used in the creed to refer to the procession of the Holy Spirit. So you do have Latin fathers who talk about the procession of the Spirit from the Father and the Son. And what I would argue is that in most cases, that relationship is captured by what Orthodox Christians are saying by energetic procession or eternal manifestation. Uh, so there are different things which can be signified by this phrase. I think when specifically you're articulating it with the logic that it was uh, spelled out with in the Council of Florence, I think that's where you get your problems. Sorry, I muted myself so you didn't hear the background. Okay, two more questions for me for clarification, then we got some questions. I don't know if I heard correctly because again, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to go rewatch this why I prefer not to be a mod controlling my channel because distractions, but two questions for me that are important for me to understand and come to a educated opinion because I wanna be faithful to the truth as hammered out by the early church. First question is, for the church for the first thousand years, you mentioned St. Maximus Confessor, but I recall reading, and again, I haven't gone back to check the accuracy of the citations or if they're taken out of context, but I have found even on, let's say, Catholic Answers, where they'll have citations from Christians, church fathers, writers, where they argue that they talked about the spirit proceeding from the father and the son or the spirit from the father through the son. So my question is, for me, the most important thing is, what did the early church teach, especially when they're in unison prior to the schism? So if someone were to study, let's say, the church fathers from the second century until the schism, would they find unanimity, the fathers unanimously saying the spirit proceeds from the father alone or a majority, or are they divided? 
what would they find if they looked to the because for me the most important thing is the fathers especially before they were in schism so i think part of that is a question of interpretation right where it's it's a debate about what exactly this or that uh, patristic text is actually saying i would say based on what saint maximus said based on what he said in conversation with actual living representatives of the Latin tradition in his day, based on his own study of the fathers of East and West, I would say that the Orthodox position, as I've tried to articulate it here, is the position of the vast majority of the fathers in both East and West. And that uh, means that I think it's incumbent upon Orthodox scholars of the fathers to not just give up the game on the Latin fathers, but to seek an exegesis of the Latin patristic tradition, which is faithful to the way that Maximus read it, because of course, when he was reading it, he was able to actually talk to Latin theologians. Uh, I, I've seen some good stuff started to come out about that. Um, but I don't want to say absolute unanimity, because you know, with anything, you can always have exceptions to the rule. So you know, with, for example, universalism, you have a couple fathers of the church who seem to be universalists, uh, but the vast, vast majority of the tradition the vast, vast majority of the fathers are speaking with one voice on that particular issue. Um, and on the filioque, I would say that it's analogous to the uh, question of universalism, where in both the East and West, the vast majority of the fathers of the church would articulate a position which is faithful to uh, what the Orthodox position is. Yeah, for me, if it's majority, then majority rules, unless there's strong contextual reasons to go against the majority. Now, the final question for me, and we got some good questions coming for you. What makes, if the spirit does not proceed from the father and the son or from the father through the son, what makes the spirit, you may have addressed it, but I got distracted, than the spirit of the son? Because in the New Testament, you'll find verses where the Holy Spirit is said to be the spirit of the son, the spirit of Christ. Even when you alluded to the fact that he's a spirit of truth and Jesus is the truth. So then what would be the grounds for the Holy Spirit to be said to be the spirit of the son, not just the father? Just like Jesus is the son of the father alone, because the father begets him alone, and he's not the son of the spirit. So just to rephrase it so you understand where I'm going with it. And I know you know, but I want also have people understand what, what my question is so I don't lose them. Jesus is the only begotten son of the father. He is the father's son alone, because the father alone begets him, not the spirit. So he's not the son of the father and the spirit. So then if the spirit proceeds from the father alone, which is why he's the spirit of the father, then what makes him the Holy Spirit of the son, not just the spirit of the father, because the New Testament, he's the spirit of the son and the father, if he doesn't proceed from the son or through the son? If you can answer that. Because the father produces the person of the spirit for the son, and he gives the Holy Spirit to the son. I'm talking about eternity here, not just in time. Um, he gives the spirit to the son, and that gift itself calls for a reciprocal relation of the Son to the Father. So the Son, having received the Holy Spirit from the Father, returns that same Spirit to the Father in an thank act of thanksgiving, in an act of reciprocal love. And so the Holy Spirit specifically realizes and manifests the relation of the Father to the Son the communion between the two of them, which is why he creates all relationships in the world. And thus he's called the spirit of both the father and the son, because what he discloses in his being the person of the Holy Spirit is the character of the relation between these two divine persons. But the character of that relationship itself includes the primacy of the father as the one who first gives and the son as the one who receives and reciprocates. So it's really essential that the, the, uh, the person of the Son is presupposed when we talk about the procession of the Spirit. So he's the third person and not the second person. To call him the Spirit of the Father is to say he's the Spirit of the Father and the Son. And the, um, uh, what he expresses, what he reveals to both, to both Father and Son and to creatures is the relation between the two, and that relation includes the primacy of the Father. All right. Now, that was my question. Now, Alan Ruhl... Now, he's also a very charitable, friendly Catholic apologist, and he knows church history, very gracious, and he's not antagonistic. Maybe if you we get two on two, and if he's interested, 
Maybe we'll bring him on. But his question for you is, do you agree with Photius that the filioque leads to sibilianism or semi-sibilianism? Thanks for the good presentation. God bless. Uh, so for those who don't know, uh, Sibelianism is the idea, uh, we call it modalism as well, that uh, there is one God and one divine person, but that one divine person manifests himself uh, or reveals himself in the mode of father at one point in history, then as a son in another point of history, and then at the, as the spirit in another point of history. And the argument that uh, St. Photius and the Orthodox tradition is made in relation to civilianism is that the metaphysical error, which creates civilianism, is a collapse of the distinction between nature and person. It's a collapse of the distinction between that which constitutes God as God and that which constitutes the divine persons as uniquely the divine persons. So those two things are related to each other. The divine nature subsists or is realized only in the communion of the three divine persons, but they are not identical uh, to one another. So the reason that the filioque has sometimes been called semi sibelian is because the idea is if the father is communicating something by generation of the son, and that, and that thing which is communicated is the son's being the source of the spirit, well, then you have something which is neither quite a hypostatic property nor quite a property of nature because it's shared by two and lacked by one. But those things which are shared by two must be shared by three, because all three have the same divine nature. Those things which uh, belong only to one must belong only to one, because the hypostases are exactly what are irreducibly distinct. So yes, I would uh, broadly agree with that, at least as it regards the position that was spelled out at the Council of Florence. Okay, second question, Augustus. Can you speak a bit more about the difference between the hypostases, properties, and energy? So three terms for the people who are catching on learning theology as I am. These are new things for me as well. Hypostases, hypostases, properties, and energies. What's the difference between the three? And if how viewing the essence, God's essence, as being identical to the energies, that the energy's essence are identical, that might lead to the belief in the filioque. I just want so to clarifying it for everyone else because these are terms we're learning. These are technical terms, hypostases and properties and energies, energia. But I'm I'm sure you got the question. Okay, so um, when we talk about a hypostatic property, we're talking about that which constitutes the divine person as uniquely that divine person. So the hypostatic property of the son being generate from the father, that's constitutive of his sonship. That is the one thing which makes him the unique self whom he is. That is also the way in which he has divine nature. So the divine nature is what constitutes God as God. And the way in which you have na that nature is determined by your hypostasis. So the son is a unique self. That self is divine. The way in which he's divine is the son. And energy is a realization and actualization of that which is inherent in the nature. In other words, if the nature is more than an abstraction, it has to have energies. It has to have concrete, real uh, uh, qualities, properties of existence. Now to say that the sun has a way of being, well, that being is the energies. Okay, so he, because he is the, uh, because he is generate, that is what constitutes him as the sun. And because he is the sun, the energies, those qualities of existence are cashed out and realized in a way proper to that sonship. So it's not constitutive of that sonship, but it is coextensive with it. In other words, if he is the son, then he has this unique idiom. We can say it in accent. He has a unique accent, a unique rhythm in which, uh, in terms of which he realizes the divine nature. So to say that he realizes the divine nature, well, the realization of that divine nature is the energy or energies, both singular and plural are used in church history. And the way in which it is realized is proper to his sonship. So the same energies are realized in all three persons, but they're realized in three distinct ways. And the ways in which they're distinguished from one another are proper to uh, their personhood. And it always is about the way that they relate to each other. So the son is constituted as a son because he's generate from the father. What does it mean to say that he realizes divine nature in a uniquely filial way? Well, that has to do with the way in which he directs those energies to the Father in relation to the person of the Spirit. Um, 
I, if, if you guys are interested in this, I did, um, I wrote an article um, about this. Uh, it's called um, Energies of the Trinity. Um, it was uh, published in uh, a journal called Rule of Faith. So if you just look up Energies of the Trinity, Rule of Faith, you'll find that article. And I look at this relationship a little more systematically uh, there and perhaps more clearly. Uh, Sam, I don't know if this is just me, but I can't hear you. Yeah, I muted myself. Sorry. So, Lord, we have an eminent guest here. I was told Jared Joff, Dr. Jared Joff, Eastern Catholic. And hopefully, maybe because I want to bring the leading heavy hitters from all camps together. Lord, I'm, uh, Seraphim is here. I'm going to try to even get Dr. Bo Branson so we can have two Orthodox representatives of the Orthodox position and then Eric Ibarra, and I'll probably have him discuss and bring you all together. I think that would be good. Bring all together. But he's saying, love to chat to you. Hopefully, Dr. Jared Joff will set it up by the grace of God, because I want to learn. And I've been told that all of you guys are very gracious, loving, and very knowledgeable in your area, areas of expertise. And you guys can agree to disagree without being <clears throat> antagonistic. And that's what I want. Now, we have another question for you, brother. Here it goes. Are sending or giving hypostatic attributes? <clears throat> characteristic of the father alone or are they capable of being shared with the son so i don't know if he's re well anyway you probably understand because uh you can you you said earlier if i heard you that the spirit can be sent from the father by the son into the world that would be the economic uh, trinity the, what we call it so i don't know if he's referring to that but okay you probably get the understand the question better than me are sending or giving Hypostatic, in other words, properties that belong to the father alone, or are they capable of being shared with the son? So go ahead, I guess. I, you'll understand the question better than I did. Sure. Okay, so when we talk about sending or giving, we're talking about a relation had among the persons that is um, that is the idiom in which the energies are expressed. Okay, so the son is constituted as the son in his being generate from the father. And in being generated from the Father, the relations that he has with the divine person, the other divine persons, according to the energies, according to the operations, uh, have a unique tenor or uh, accent to them. So when we talk about the Father giving the Son the person of the Holy Spirit, that gift which he gives to the Son is a way of talking about what happens energetically. But the unique um, it's hard to think of a word to capture this. The unique directionality of the energetic relations of the divine persons to each other is rooted in them being the unique persons that they are. So because the son is the son, his godhood is realized in these unique relations he has with the Father and the Holy Spirit. But those realizations uh, that uh, of his godhood through his sonship are not the same thing as actually constituting him as the son or as God. So these things are all coextensive, which makes this really, you have to be really, really precise about what you're saying because they're all coextensive. They always go together, but they're not reducible to each other. They're not identifiable with each other. So it's like saying, uh, we'd say that the son uh, uh, has a divine will in the incarnation and a human will. To talk about a divine will and a human will is to talk about something which always goes together with divine energies and human energies. They're coextensive with each other, but they're not identical with each other. So coextensivity is a really important, I think, relationship to, to understand because that uh, helps us navigate a lot of these questions. Uh, in relation to Dr. Goff, um, I really recommend that folks check out Dr. Goff's work. Um, uh, he has, he's a very good theologian. Um, he knows great deal more about the Franciscan theological tradition uh, than I do. Um, and he's part of the reason that I kind of qualify what I say about um, Catholic theology in the, in the, in the Middle Ages with those notes about the Franciscan tradition. So I would recommend people look up Dr. Goff. Uh, he's, he's a very eminent theologian and scholar. So far, we have only two more questions here. And then maybe I'll ask a final question, Lord willing. We're going to still set it up where we can bring 
either one on one, you and Eric, or we'll do two on two. We're work, we're working on that with your prayers. If you're praying, guys, ask the Holy Spirit's will be to, will be done in our lives, and that we yield fully, completely to the Spirit. Either it's going to be Seraphim and Eric, or it's going to be two on two, or we'll see how it works. Maybe Seraphim and Eric, and then another session with some others. But I want to bring in more people, and I want to bring in them together on one platform to interact, because we need to do more than one or two series on the filioque, because this is a major issue. Like he said, it's not just the papacy, it's a filioque. And if the Lord Jesus is pleased, Lord willing, we'll bring in heavy hitters on the papacy as well, because these are the issues that I'm struggling with and I need to learn. Now, full armor apologetics. Can you elaborate on why the Cappadocians at Constantinople are so significant to this very topic? Uh, the Cappadocian Fathers, this term refers to uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Gregory the Theologian, and St. Basil the Great. Um, and the Cappadocian Fathers in the 4th century were fundamental in defending what had been accomplished at the Council of Nicaea and in shaping the language to accommodate the precise concepts that needed to be communicated. So uh, the uh, way in which we use the language of nature and person and energy, in fact, uh, it depends uh, a great deal on the legacy of the Cappadocian Fathers. Uh, in fact, by tradition, St. Gregory of Nyssa is said to be the one who inserted the phrase who proceeds from the Father into the Creed at the 381 Council. Um, uh, St. Basil the Great, in his, I think it's On the Holy Spirit, he refers to the Spirit as an image of the Son. And I think this is really important. This is an important way of understanding what's going on here. So the Son is the exact imprint of the Father's person. The Son reveals who the Father is in his being Son, because when we talk about sonship, we're talking about fatherhood by implication. St. Basil says the Spirit is the uh, imprint of the Son. Well, I think the way in which this is the case is that the Holy Spirit is the one who adopts us into sonship because the Holy Spirit as being the gift of the Father for the Son and the reciprocal gift of the Son for the Father, the Spirit is the one who's expressing the relation between the two and thus who draws us into that relationship and reveals to us the quality of that relationship. So the legacy of the Cappadocians is very, very important in understanding the procession of the Holy Spirit because they deal both with a legitimate monopatrism, the way in which the Spirit proceeds from the Father alone, but also the essential understanding of the way in which the Spirit manifests from eternity and not only in time, the character of the relation of Father and Son to each other. And I would still, some people have, have in the um, in the chat uh, recommended uh, a Perry Robinson, and I would just kind of echo that. Perry is a great guy. Um, he knows a great deal on this subject, a great deal more than than I do. So I would recommend people check out his blog, which is actually named after this. It's energeticprocession.wordpress.com. Uh, um, uh, so we don't agree on everything, uh, but I generally defer to him. I'm going to be putting the links to your YouTube <clears throat> channel and site, but share it right now. <clears throat> Sorry your YouTube channel and uh, site. So I, I'm going to put the links in the description box, but share it right now before we go to the two final questions. Okay, so my YouTube channel, the URL is youtube.com slash Cabane, K-A-B-A-N-E. The If you just search Seraphim Hamilton, though, you'll find the channel. Um, I also have a Patreon, patreon.com slash Cabane, K-A-B-A-N-E. And the blog I just recommended is energeticprocession.wordpress.com. So it's really an excellent resource, not just for this issue, but for a whole variety of issues. And it has a recommended reading list where you can find a list of very good, very high quality books on this and other theological subjects. Now, what about also Dr. Bo Branson? Because he was recommended as being your tag team if we had a two on two. Should I? Is another person to bring on? I don't know Dr. Branson very well. I haven't done much reading into his work. I've only heard good things, um, I, but I'm not sure of the sources people would go to to read him. All right, I'll ask Guy because he might recommended him and you. So, but we'll see. All right, because I want to bring in a few more people representing the Orthodox Catholic position, a few more heavy hitters, and then either have you do one on one with Eric, two on two. We'll decide whatever you guys are comfortable with. Lord Jesus willing, guys, I promise you, if you're praying, God's will be done that God confirms it. I'm going to bring in a few more heavy headers to give their presentations, and then we're going to bring them to have a discussion. One-on-one, two-on-two, we'll see. We'll probably have what they call a battle royal, 
20 Orthodox, 20 Catholic. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Uh, two more questions. I heard someone say that Charlemagne and the bishops <clears throat> introduced the filioque to refute Islam. Can you elaborate on this? Was this brought into silence? Because I also heard myself recently from an, someone who was arguing that the Eastern Catholic actually claimed that the reason why the filioque was added later is because the rise of Arianism and to combat that, to show that Jesus is fully equal in divinity to the Father. So what's the story here? Uh, so on this specific question, I kind of have to say, I don't really, uh, I'm not really sure what the gentleman is referring to. So I don't want to talk just out of my behind here, but um, uh, on the question of Arianism. So this is the idea that because the son is consubstantial with the father, because he receives all that he has from the father, he also receives the property of producing the person of the Holy Spirit in virtue of his consubstantiality. Um, and so this is seen by some as a way of defending the divinity of the son. But the argument that the Orthodox make is that it, in so doing, undermines the divinity of the person of the Holy Spirit. Um, but there is a way in terms of um, what we call the eternal manifestation, the energetic procession, um, because energies are always dependent on and realize nature. And because the way in which they realize nature is always filtered through the uniqueness of the hypostases, that the spirit manifests the common energy and the threefold reality of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is also a way of defending the divinity of the Son. So this language, when it's used in Latin, just the language itself, Obviously, it has to be interpreted in context. The language itself, when you see the word prosedit in relation to both father and son, is not something which is exclusive from the Orthodox teaching. It just depends on what you mean by that. And both paths are paths which you could say are a defense of the divinity and consubstantiality of the son. Again, because energy reveals essence and consubstantiality means common essence. If the spirit reveals that the father and son have one energy, then he also reveals by implication, that they have one essence. See, I liked, I liked you when I said final question because now Ortho Christo is one of my mods. Ask a question because I want to ask a question for the Orthodox perspective on this. So second to last question. And guys, when we're done with the questions, I'll have our brother make some final comments. But don't go away because I have some things I want to share with you, especially about a session I plan on doing tomorrow. But I want to see if you want me to do that session by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Ortho Christos wants to know his view on Pope Leo III, who reportedly displayed the creed without the filioque in Rome. Yeah, so this is where there's a controversy between Eastern the Eastern Church, parts of the Western Church about the recitation of the filioque in the creed. Uh, and Leo III, the Pope at Rome, the uh, Pope of Rome at the time, had it engraved without the filioque as a statement about the filioque. So what most commentators on this event say is that he confessed the filioque as doctrine, but rejected its recitation in the creed. That it's not impossible that that's true. You can make an argument for that from some of his letters. However. I'm not taking a position on this, but I would just say that because the connotation of the Latin word for procession is very specific when we talk about the creed, you could potentially make an argument that when it is used in the creed, it has a more specific and heretical meaning than it would have when it's used in other contexts where it's subject to a variety of interpretations. And given what I said earlier, given the points that Dr. Goff has made in other contexts, um, even in the early part of the second millennium, after the schism, people are meaning different things when they talk about the filioque way, some of which are not as objectionable as others. So whether Leo III was insisting that it be interpreted in a way which excluded its being recited in the creed, or whether he was just saying procedurally, don't recite it in the creed, but we really believe all of this, I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to talk out of my behind. I'm undecided on the issue. Uh, it's something to, to think about further. Uh, but it's a really good question. And I'm not really satisfied with those who just say, well, he, he was okay with it. He thought it was true, but he didn't want it recited in the creed. Um, but we'll see. Actually, that is more commendable and more Christ-like not to speak in matters that someone doesn't know, because if we speak on areas we haven't studied, we're going to give an answer to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And then that means it's about pride and ego. So glory to Jesus Christ when we have brothers and sisters who will just say that something I'm not too clear or certain about, so I'm going to refrain from sharing something. May we all have that attitude. May we all have that spirit to glorify Jesus Christ and not for ego. May he destroy our egos in the name of the Father and of the Son, the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Glory to God for that. Now, final question, brother. Revelation 22, verse 1, I've heard. I, I've read Revelation 22, verse 1, in light of it being Trinitarian in this way. In Revelation 22, verse 1, it says that John saw the rivers of living water or the river of the water of life proceeding from the throne singular of the Father and the Son. Now, I am aware that John in John 7, 38 to 39, identifies the rivers of living waters or the fountain of the waters of life as the Spirit. And when Jesus says, if you believe in him, as the Scripture says, from your innermost belly will flow rivers of living water. And then 39, John 7, 39, John says, of this he was speaking about the Holy Spirit. So in Revelation 22, verse 1, I have seen it, and I've read certain fathers agree, that the rivers of the living water that flows from the throne, singular, of the Father and the Son, would be a metaphor of the Holy Spirit being poured forth or coming forth from the Father and the Son's authority, the, the authority they share in common, to animate and sustain the new heavens and new earth. I have heard Catholics say that this supports the filioque. Why? Because it says that the spirit, which is being described as the rivers of living water, flows from, originates from, the throne that equally belongs to the Father and the Son. Now, how would an Orthodox respond to that in, the, in light of if it's the throne of the Father and the Son, meaning their equal authority that they possess, and the spirit proceeds from Father and Son equally, isn't that some indication of the filioque? How would an Orthodox respond to that? So um, when we talk about the filioque, we're talking very specifically about the question of what is the constitutive property of the person of the spirit? Is he constituted as the spirit by receiving his nature from father and son together? Or are we talking about the spirits proceeding from the father, but always in relation to the son? So the Spirit proceeds from the Father as the Spirit of the Father and Son because the purpose, if we can speak that way, of his procession is to reveal the love of the Father for the Son and then to reveal the love of the Son to the Father, thereby revealing the communion that exists between the two. So when the Spirit comes into us, he comes into us as the one who incorporates us into the very life of the Son. And thus we also are called children of God. And thus, as you alluded to, it is also said of us that the Spirit flows from our hearts. I mean, and this is true. The Spirit is reflected through us to others. And in fact, in Revelation uh, 2 to 3, uh, it is Jesus says, uh, whoever conquers will sit down with me on my throne as I will sit as I have sat down with my father on his throne. So there's no question that if by procession, what we mean is that the spirit is eternally flowing from father and son to reveal the communion between the two, then the spirit proceeds from the father and the son. When we say the spirit proceeds from the father alone, we're using it in a much more narrow sense about the way in which he's constituted as the person of the Holy Spirit. So I would just suggest to people that this is not actually an issue of, um, of, of, economic versus imminent trinity. This is not an issue of, well, Rome says eternity, orthodoxy says time. Uh, this is an issue, I would say, of hypostasis and energy. Is this an energetic procession, which would imply that it's something we can be drawn into? It's something that incorporates us into um, uh, the love of God? Or is this a hypostatic procession? And because we don't share in the constitutive principles of the persons of the Trinity, it's not something we're incorporated into, if the Spirit is called the Spirit of the Son in virtue of that being his hypostatic origin, well then, in fact, you separate his being the Spirit of the Son from everything the New Testament draws from that, which is that he's the Spirit of the Son because he's the one through whom we are drawn into sonship. Brother, that's it for the questions. Now... Guys, please don't leave because after he makes some final comments, I want to also share a few things because I need your feedback about a session I want to do, Lord willing, tomorrow. But, brother, any final comments and words 
And then again, and I'll put the link to your YouTube channel, Patreon, Lord willing, shortly after our, this session is over. Any final comments? And Lord willing, again, we're going to bring you back to either have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with Eric Ibarra and or maybe a tag team. But I know that some people prefer one-on-one. -on -one, so if that's the case, maybe you and Eric Ibarra can come together one-on-one. -on -one. But then I'll try to also do talks with other eminent Orthodox and Catholic <clears throat> theologians, apologists who are well-read in this area. But any final comments on your part? So this issue is often seen as very obscure, very esoteric, and not really relevant to us. But what I would say is that the New Testament calls us to be renewed in knowledge after the image of our Creator. It calls us to search out the hidden mysteries of God, and it invites us to grow into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ by knowing God in His wisdom. This issue is, as a matter of historical reality, is absolutely fundamental to probably the greatest tragedy in the history of the church, which is the schism between East and West. And I would say that if you are interested in theology at all, it's important that you study this issue to one degree or another, because we're dealing here with the uh, what it means for God to exist as God. And because everything else is derived from God, this has downstream implications for everything else. So if we are to grow into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ and to be renewed in knowledge after the image of our creator and to think God's thoughts after him and so come to one mind, then we need to take this issue seriously. So I would just enjoin people to, number one, take the issue seriously. Number two, or perhaps number one, pray constantly for the resolution of the schism, which means you've got to be woken out of our just our not caring about it or taking it for granted. Uh, uh, and... Um, uh, number three, last thing I wanted to say is check out this book um, by uh, Edward Sachensky called The Filioque, History of a Doctrinal Controversy. He's the same gentleman who wrote this dissertation on Maximus the Confessor. Um, I don't necessarily agree with everything in it, but it's a very good discussion of this subject. Um, and then also his book, The Papacy and the Orthodox, is a great discussion of the history of the schism. So uh, my YouTube channel, for those who are interested, is youtube.com slash Kabane, K-A-B-A-N-E. Two or three times a week, I do a live stream where I take questions, um, take all super chats, and then I also have a Patreon, uh, uh, which is patreon.com slash Kabane, K-A-B-A-N-E. Uh, and one of the things on there is you can talk to me one-on-one -on -one for an hour um, if you so choose. Um, so thank you so much for uh, giving me you know, your time. And uh, I hope to see you guys again soon to talk more about this important issue. Glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. I will be bringing you up back on by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Like I said, on not just this topic, other topics, God willing, you'll be back on if you want to anyway. I mean, my, my channel's open for you. But I will try to get you to discuss with Eric Ibarra, one on one, God willing, in the upcoming week. So, guys, pray for that. God's will be done. I want to get Eric and him to discuss. And then maybe in the future, two on two, or we'll bring others. But if God wills, this is going to be a regular because these are issues I need to learn. But thank you, brother. And like I said, anytime you want to come and talk about a topic to help us grow, because I'm learning, my channel is your channel. It's open for you. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. We love you for the sake of the Lord. Thank you so much. Oh, and uh, please pray for me. Uh, please pray for me, Seraphim. Uh, also, please uh, keep uh, Magdalena in your prayers. So and Magdalena, uh, too. I don't. That's my girlfriend. Oh, OK. I didn't I didn't well, want to keep your heart out. <laughs> Chuck Norris look alike is off the market. He's in already with someone <laughs> in Jesus name. May the Lord bring you and Mary oh, Mary. May the Lord Magdalene. Jesus, may the Lord Jesus bring you and Magdalena together, become one flesh to glorify Christ in your marriage in Jesus' name. Ladies, he's off the market. Chuck Norris lookalikes off the market. So God bless you, brother. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. God bless. You. Okay, now, folks, just a few final uh, comments and need your advice. Number one, I want to start a new series. Tomorrow, Lord willing, I want to do the first in a series because it may, may take me two or three on Augustine's view of the Trinity appearing in Genesis 18. I don't know if you know this, but there was a view held by some early church writers and fathers. St. Augustine happened to be one of them, that the three men of Genesis 18 
were actually the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, appearing as three distinct men to Abraham. So I want to do that series because a while back I did a session. I did a session where I argue that you can show from Genesis 18, 19, the Trinity appeared, Father appeared, Son appeared, Holy Spirit appeared as three men. And then the Father would have returned to heaven with the other two, the Son and the Spirit, being the messengers of the Father who went to Sodom to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. This was a view held by Augustine, St. Augustine. Now, to prepare for the series, I already finished two of the three parts that go with the series. If you check my community section, I link to parts one and two of a three-part series of articles showing why Augustine and why the evidence suggests strongly that the three men happen to be the Father, Son, and Spirit. So if you guys want me to do it, part one will be tomorrow because then I'll come back, God willing, the rest of the week, finish my response to Muslim men retard, and finish the <clears throat> other series that I've begun, began by the grace of Jesus Christ, such as the church father's view of the son not knowing the, the day or hour. Lord willing, I'll do that this week with your prayers, with the Spirit filling me and purifying me and the blood of Jesus Christ, I'll do that. So tomorrow I'll do part one. If you're interested, put a one and we'll see. Put a two if no. Now, secondly, sadly, yesterday they pulled down the session I did yesterday. And I have to tell you, I was also blessed by the session. The session was amazing, hilariously funny. When we went through the Hadith and show how stupid, irrational, Muhammad is and how stupid Islam is and its teachings, how laughable the teachings were. In fact, it was so funny. People were like on the floor laughing. And then we went into some meat showing how Jesus and his followers identify Jesus as God in the absolute sense and response to Muslim matter retired. But sadly, because of a YouTube channel where I played the song, Knowing You, Jesus, they complained and it was pulled down and I complained. I complained. I complained, I should say. I filed a complaint, and hopefully YouTube will restore it in Jesus' name sooner than later. But if not, Protestant believers here, he downloaded the talk, and if they don't restore it, we will edit out that section where I play the song, Knowing You, Jesus. I want to get it back, and I'm very disappointed that Satan used this channel to get it pulled down. In Jesus' name, may be restored, so pray for that. And thirdly and finally, the video is still there, but it's not. Is it visible? I hope. I hope it's visible. Anyway, thirdly, yeah, copyright. And you know who complained, Crisis King? A channel where I played the song, Knowing You, Jesus. Oh, it's back on? No, what do you mean? No, it says, no, it's not on. Uh, Protestant, because you have access to my account, you see it. No one else sees it. It's been pulled down. That's why I asked you to download it, and then you may have to edit the song, Knowing You, Jesus, completely, and reload it. But let's wait. Pray for the miracle. It gets restored by today in Jesus' name. Thirdly and finally. Okay, yeah, but brother, you and I see it. He just gave you the link. Can you guys click on it, see if it's there? For you and me, it works because you have access to my account because you upload stuff for me. I don't think it works for anyone else. So he just gave you the link. You download it, but it won't show up on my channel until... No, brother, that's not it. No. Protestant believer, you downloaded the wrong one. Uh-oh, we're not going to get it. Sorry, brother. That's not it. You sent me part three. The one I sent you is part four, and it's not this one. This is the one I did. So did you get the right one when I sent you the link? So I guess he did uh-oh, we're in trouble, guys. It's gone. So we got to pray that God will restore it. I thought he downloaded the right one. Nope, that's not it, brother. I sent you the link to the one that was banished. And yeah, I thought you got it, but I guess you went to the wrong one. So we're going to try it again. I'm going to send you the link again. That's the wrong one, brother. It's not the right one. That's part three. The one that was pulled down was part four. And I thought I sent you the link. I'll try it again and see if you get it. But you got to be on for you to get it. You got to be on my account. All right. That's not the one, brother. Wrong one. If you ever give me misinformation again, you're going to get blocked and full armor apologetics is going to take over 
your position fully and completely. Oh, so you did download that one? Well, the one I sent you was the one that shows up here. Let me show you. This is the one. Okay. This one I sent you. Here. Let me do this. Uh, here, on my phone. Let me go to history. It shows up on me for me. Here it is. This is the one, brother. This is the one I sent you. Ah, uh, shit. Up. Here you go. This is the one. That's the one I sent you. See, it shows up for me, guys. This is the one. It shows up for me. See? This was yesterday. This shows up for me because it's on my account, but it doesn't show up for you. You see that? That handsome-looking beast, handsome Assyrian beast, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, getting healthier and more fit. May the Lord give me the supernatural power and grace to stay fit, keep the weight off, and be healthy and holier. More love with Jesus. There you go. That was it right there. They pulled it down. Is that the one you, you saw, Protestant? Because I sent you the link. So you may have to come on my account. That's it, guys. Pray we can get it restored. Pray for the miracle, guys. They pulled it down. It was amazing. It was beautiful. Showing how stupid Islam is. And we were laughing to the point that people passed out. Some people urinated in their pants. Some people got eight pack. And then we saw how miraculous the Bible is and showing that Jesus is God in the flesh. Irrefutable. I don't want to have to do this session over again, by the grace of God. I pray it gets restored. Pray for it in Jesus' name. So Lord willing, tomorrow, part one on the Trinity in Genesis 18 and 19. Lord willing, I'll do part four. I'm sorry, part five. That was part four. Lord Jesus, save me from Aaron, confusion and sin. Rebuke Satan in Jesus' name. I did part four, but it's pulled down. I'm going to do part five. And in Jesus' name, as we pray, God restore part four. And then I'm going to do another in the series of the early church fathers' understanding of why the Son did not know that they're ours. So all of these sessions are planned. And don't forget Wednesday, Eric Yabara will be here. Make these sessions go viral. Let's get 300, 400 people, 500 people watching us live. More subscribers for the glory of Jesus, not for my praise. But the final word of exhortation. Final word of exhortation. Guys, you do not help me learn when you have trolls, and I blocked a lot of Catholic and Orthodox trolls, filthy, wicked, vile demons, a disgrace to Jesus Christ, a disgrace to the church, and a disgrace to their respective churches, coming here attacking, mocking, ridiculing, or arguing, because then you distract me, because I'm focused on the trolls and the demons to muzzle them and block them, and I'm not listening, I'm not learning. You do not do your particular church, or you do not do Christ a service, when you come here, manifest and say some stupid things, showing that you will have no class and your parents didn't do a good job of raising you with any class or dignity, shaming your parents by raising such filthy, foul dogs, and yet you claim to be Christians, shame on you. The Lord rebuke you to learn the fear of the Lord and then distracting me in the process where I can't listen. If this keeps up, I won't be doing this. I want to bring in Orthodox and Catholics to present their cases so I can learn because I'm on a journey, but you're hindering me. And if this keeps up, I won't deal with the headache. I won't bring them back. Carry yourself with dignity and represent your church with honor and integrity. You're going to turn people off. Stop it. Don't be stupid. Okay, you think the other person's a heretic? Okay, keep it to yourself. You think they're wrong? Fine. That's why I'm bringing in Orthodox to show you why he thinks the Orthodox position is right. The Catholic isn't. Then I'll bring a Catholic and they'll bring them together. Be patient. Don't manifest as dogs showing you're no Christians. You're more in love with your culture and your tradition than you are with Jesus Christ. And you're not going to heaven by loving your culture or your tradition more than Jesus and truth. You'll be the first burning in hell. May God have mercy. May God save us. And may God transform us that we don't end up in hell, but we love Jesus and his truth more than anything. Glory to the Father, glory to the Son, glory to the Holy Spirit. And Mackenzie, you see, this Chuck Norris lookalike is off limits, sister. I know you love the man, and you were just, like, melting. He's already seeing someone, and the Lord will bring them together. So, Mackenzie, I'm hurt for you, sister. Sucks being you. I know you wanted to marry a Chuck Norris lookalike. 
He's not Bruce Lee. Don't ever insult me by calling him Bruce Lee, okay? I love Bruce Lee. That Chuck Norris lookalike will never be Bruce Lee. But with that said, guys, Lord Jesus winning, I will see you tomorrow, part one on Trinity and the Old Testament out. To prepare yourselves, go to my community section. I already uploaded two parts of a three-part series. And in part two, I quote St. Augustine, who argued it was the Trinity that appeared to Abraham. So this is not a new interpretation or a novel interpretation. It is a view held by certain fathers, including St. Augustine. That doesn't mean he's right, but it doesn't mean he's wrong. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. He is alive. May the Lord Jesus purify us, cleanse us, and wash us, our loved ones, my daughters, in his blood. May the Lord Jesus fill us, fill our loved ones, my daughters, with the Holy Spirit to keep us in love with the Lord Jesus. Never shame Jesus. Never blaspheme Jesus. Never to fall into any scandal. But finish the race with integrity and love and glorify Jesus Christ until he summons us or until he returns. And may the Lord Jesus give me the supernatural grace to stay fit and be healthy and use my help to glorify him and to raise my daughters in the fear of Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Maranathe. Lord willing, see you tomorrow.